Welcome. All right, welcome everyone. It's, it's great to see you tonight. Uh, I'm S.C. Moedi. I'm the, the founder of Products That Count. This is where Products That Count started like three and a half years ago. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about tonight's event. And before I start, I want to ask, like, who has been to one of our programs before? Okay, about a half. That's, that's our usual. Uh, and, and we love that. We, we, uh, somebody was asking me earlier, like, when do I become a member that counts? And we have that program. Uh, if you come to our programs like five times in a, in a year, we, we give you a really cool card and discounts at our events and we invite you to our holiday party and so on. So you have to come five times in the year, five times out of 12. Um, so one thing that makes products that count really special is that every month we bring you a, a C-level, a high caliber speaker to talk about what it takes to build a great product. And we take a lot of different angles. Tonight, we're, talking the, we're, we're taking the angle of how do you build a great brand uh, and, and work that into a, a product and, and brand together and marketing together. Um, but, but really, we're also not only selecting super great speakers who have a lot of depth and are great presenters, that's a hard combo, but we're also asking them to share something that they've never shared before, something unique, right? And so tonight, we're very lucky because we have a brand new talk. About half of our speakers decide that they're going to do a brand new talk uh, every month. And then some speakers say, OK, I'll talk about something I know and I've shared already, but I, I'll add something new to it. So before we start, I want to thank our, our amazing partners. I want to thank Yelp for being an amazing host. <laughs> Those guys have been with us since from day one, they're an amazing team. Uh, you, you would love working with them. The, the team that we work with has been there for you know, three plus years, so it, it's a great place to work. And if you're interested in careers, there's a big Yelp sign right back there, red. Go talk to them after, after the program. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Amplitude, uh, our, another sponsor. We're uh, also very lucky to be an investor in Amplitude because we believe it's not only a, a great product, but also a, a fantastic business. Uh, if you want to talk to the Amplitude folks about setting up a, an analytics platform for your product that's both very easy and very powerful, they are right over there. If you want to look back, they're waving at you right here. And they also... Uh, this is like walking down memory lane. They also brought like a, a, a dozen of my, my books. So a year and a half ago, I, I wrote a book on what it takes to build a great product. And I, I did some of that promotion for a little while. So I was signing my books at Products That Count uh, every month. And I see some smiles like, yes, we have your book. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I actually have a picture like right there with everybody like holding my book the, the day that it launched. And so the fact that they brought those books, it's really a, a, an awesome uh, trip down memory lane for me. So I'll be signing them after the event if you want to get a, a free copy and, and read some of my thoughts on, on building great products. So thank you for doing that, you guys. Uh, I also want to thank M M Particle. M Particle is a great uh, data infrastructure platform that you want to have if you have like a, a lot of different data sources to get visibility into your product. Uh, can I can I have the folks from M Particle? Yes, over there. Thank you very much. And then Pragmatic Marketing, which is a great organization if you're looking to learn more about like get training or get training for your team about what it takes to build great products. We we really respect their programs. So thank you to all of you guys. And without further ado, I want to say welcome back to Gib Biddle. Uh, Gib is a, is a favorite uh, speaker at Products That Count. He gets a, an amazing net promoter score because after every event, we always measure you know, the, the quality of our events and, and we treat our events the way we treat. Uh, I used to treat products when I was building products. So we measure the net promoter score and so we ask like, what did you think about this talk? And, and Gibbs always gets great, great ratings and great feedback. So I'm really, really thrilled to, uh, to welcome him back and, and look forward to his talk. Good. Welcome. Thanks a lot, I see. <laughs> How many marketing people in the room? How many folks building products? Engineers, product peeps? OK, 50-50. How many of you have arms? <laughs> I need to see them all for a moment. Okay, thank you. Some of you have two, that's way cool. All right, so I have a little pop quiz for you. I have in my pocket, in my back pocket, $50 gift certificates for either Uber or Lyft. 
and I need to know which you'd like, and you only get one. So how many folks would like the Uber gift certificate? All right. Oh, I heard a little hissing. What was, what was up there? Okay, and how many would like the lifts? Ooh, yeah, there's some lifties here. Just so I know, are there some Uber peeps here too? I didn't hear the woo-woos. Ubers? Oh my gosh, thank you. They're back here. All right, so I've been asking the same questions for a few years. Tonight, I'm gonna give it about 60% to, to Lyft and about 40% to Uber. And I promise you, about two years ago, it was about 80% Uber, 20% Lyft. I learned a lot about the personality of the room with this question. So the Lyfties, did any of you switch from Uber to Lyft in the last few years? Wow, why'd you switch? So I switched because, first off, I was in San Mateo and Uber's availability was falling off. The drivers were shifting to Lyft because of the payment problem, they were just paying them less, at least that was the perception. Yep. And then second off with the entire branding issues with all of this. Oh, I want to hear about these branding issues <laughs> and skeletons in the closet. What were they? So for example, with like the entire like I think like the gray ball program, right? Like where they were trying to dodge law enforcement, right? Like that just seems super unethical or at least very shady. And so it's like I don't want to support a business that's trying to dodge the law. Wow, anybody want to add to this? Switchers? Yeah, I got a switcher in the back. I can't say that I was, did switch, but the idea of switching now is high because of the latest article where they uh, apparently try to get around safety protocols with their auto driving so that they take out the safety side. And when you're doing that as an ethical approach to a problem in a high profile situation, it seems like a really bad choice. Wow. Wow, I loved you because you were so even-handed. You said that the service, this is Clement, the service with Lyft was a little bit better for you in San Mateo and then went to all these brand stories. This, and are there some folks, how, how many of you fundamentally think that Lyft is a better service than Uber? Ooh, a few, but only a few. How would you measure better? Go ahead. Wow, I hear you. Okay, so we've been talking about brand. And I, I got into this, um, uh, uh, to understand me as I actually joined Electronic Arts as a startup in marketing, and then I wanted to build stuff, so I switched over. Uh, and I have been engaged with many different companies where marketing people fought with product people. Can you believe it, okay? And there, really this talk is about how those teams can work together, where it's the job of the marketers to define the brand, it's the job of the product peeps to bring it to life. The reason I care about the brand is the, the way I look at my job. As a product leader, the job is to delight customers in these hard to copy, margin enhancing ways. And margin enhancing is just a fancy way of say, make money. So what are some things that are hard to copy? Like, for instance, with Netflix. What's hard to copy about Netflix? The content? What kind of content? The original content. And I actually call that economy of scale. They can afford to spend 300 million on the crown because they're so freaking big now. What else is hard to copy? Why would you not, as a punk startup, compete with Netflix today? Scale. Okay, infrastructure, there's some unique technology they have. What is the unique technology that Netflix has? Right, and they, they actually know the member tastes for 120 million people worldwide via their personalization efforts. Amazing, what else is hard to copy? For the original content, I'm gonna give you a hint. This talk is called Branding for Builders. <laughs> So I got engaged in this. These are the different things that, that I can usually work to make it hard for other folks to copy. But the really way cool thing and the reason I learned to care about the brand is it's so hard to copy. Think about today, would you hand over your credit card to Netflix each month? 
How many are members? How many are paying? <laughs> okay. I think generally you trust the brand. Okay. Okay, so the talk tonight, I'm gonna to talk about what, what the heck a brand is. I'm gonna give you two different brand models. We're gonna be working for SC tonight because we're gonna to work to position and, uh, the service called Products That Count as well as the brand. And then I'm gonna show you what the evolution of the brand at Netflix looked like. And you're gonna feel good because you'll realize how sucky it was in the beginning, okay? So what is a brand? I did what I always do, I go to Google typed in, what's a brand? And it disappointed me. It said it was a type of product manage, manufactured by a particular company, or it was an identifying mark burned on livestock. <laughs> so I gave it an F. I gave it a fail, okay? Deeply disappointed. Uh, and then I heard lots of chatter. Uh, this is my favorite. Don't worry about the brand, just build a great product. I know we've all thought that, and there's a lot of truth in this. Oh my gosh, the most powerful brands are built from the heart. I'm tearing up right now. Their foundations are stronger because they are built with the strength of the human spirit. Brand must be important. Billionaire dude, your premium brand had better deliver something special or it's not going to get the business. I found Laura Bush. Brand is the unique story that consumers recall when they think of you. In a lot of cases with Uber, you guys were, were reading me negative stories. So here is the definition that I'm working very hard for Google to pull up the next time you ask. My definition is a brand is a story that builds a trusted relationship between the customer and the product. And it's got these different components. It's got positioning, it's got a customer benefit, it's got personality that trains you on how you should relate to it. It has aspiration, and oh my God, it's got emotion. So I'm gonna work through all of these elements tonight with you in these two different models. So I wanna start with the simple concept, which is what is this word positioning? What is it? I need your help. Where are those lifty people? There's like four of them sitting together. You're hiding now. Okay, well, I've got an engineer. What is positioning, Tony? It's where you are in relation to everyone else. It's great, and where does that position live, Tony? In a consumer's mind. It's great. Was that, was that you, Laura? No. Fantastic. Well, she made you look smart, Laura. We appreciate that. Okay, so positioning is the place a brand occupies in a consumer mind. Now, you're all experts in positioning, and I, and I will illustrate that for you right now. So in a moment, I'm going to yell one word, and you tell me the brand that pops into your head first. So I say safety. Oh my God. You know, that's a very clearly positioned brand in your heads. I say, this is where it gets a little muddled, Honda. <laughs> okay, I'm hearing some reliability chatter, finally. Okay, BMW. Performance, that was pretty good. Good, oh good, good. You should hang out with the cheap person. Um, how about Mercedes? Wow, I'm hearing a lot of stuff, it's good. Tesla. Oh my God, I heard innovative right away from some extremely bright person on the left. Uh, but imagine, that's a car brand that's only 12 years old and it already owns this idea of innovation. Unbelievable. Prius. I heard hybrid, I heard slow. Uh, in my Stanford class, they say bougie. <laughs> we own two Priuses. I had to ask what bougie meant, too. All right, so this is the concept of positioning. Okay? And these car brands have spent years 
both advertising or delivering on the product. You know, Volvo has, I think, like 48 airbags in a car. I, I, I don't know why you need that many, but that's what it takes to own this concept of positioning. So what I want to do is show you the first positioning model. Uh, and it's quite simple. And then I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate it using um, Netflix. So the first one, we have to answer the question of what is it? And then what are the benefits? How does it improve customers' lives? And then the third is this personality component we talked about earlier. If we met you at a party, how would folks describe you? So I'm going to show you the positioning model that we used at Netflix. What is it? It's a TV and movie subscription service. This is intended to be sort of sixth, seventh, eighth grade language. Just trying to very quickly and easily say, what the heck is Netflix? What are the benefits? The intent is it would be fast, it would be easy, and entertaining for all of you. And it'd be a great value. And then if you asked us at Netflix how, how we wanted you to think about us from a personality point of view, we would say we wanted to be straightforward and friendly. So this is a very straightforward positioning model that it provided a lot of direction for the product team about what the product we needed to build. So here's where you have to work. We get paid for this, SC. We get beer and pizza. It's awesome. So we're going to use this first model to position products that count. So my first question is, what is products that count? Yes? Community of product leaders. It is a community of product leaders. OK, now you're going a little further. And enthusiasts. You had me at a community of product leaders. Okay? So we don't have to describe the benefits or personalities. What else could we describe it as? Yes? Education. It, oh, so give me a couple more words. This is me explaining to my mom what products that count is. It's, it educates people how to build things. OK. Simpler. It's sharing. OK, we're getting to the benefits now, I think. What is it? Yeah, hope. It's a community that helps people who care about building great products become even better at their craft. OK. Too long for me, Hope, and I love you. <laughs> OK, well, we'll see right. what SC. I'm going to show you the examples in a second. How does it make your lives better? You got it. Why are you here tonight? What were you hoping for? Helping to build things. OK. So you're, you're going to learn how to build things. What else are you hoping for benefits from something like tonight? You will network in order to build better products, build better products. OK? Get better jobs. Build cooler stuff. Whatever. And if you met products that count at a cocktail party, how would you describe him or her? Rich. <laughs> I guess that gets a second date sometimes. How else would you describe the personality of products that count? Imagine what SC aspires for this organization to be. OK, so we're describing a person. So the person is amazing. Okay. What are some other personality characteristics you might give to it? Community Think about, uh, that's good. Yes. Thoughtful. Innovative, thoughtful. These are good words. Engaging. Engaging. Okay. These are personality words that describe how you want the brand to relate to your customer. All right, so we'll show the work. Ready, SC? What is products that count? It's a worldwide network of product managers. That's what SC imagines that it's going to be as it continues to grow worldwide. Notice the little light motif. That's important for later. Okay? The benefits, it's her hope that you will connect with each other, you'll learn, and then you will grow in your careers and growing great products, just the way you talked about it. And it's SC's hope that you'll think of this organization as being friendly and authentic, one of a kind. So this is that first positioning model. 
So now I'm going to take you the second. The second one is called the brand pyramid. So we've described what products that count is, its benefits, as well as the personalities. And now we're going to go into the world of aspiration and emotion. Why are we getting into the world of emotion? Why is emotion important? Oh my God, this is Ben saying it makes things memorable. Ah! <laughs> now, Andy, are you going to remember me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's the power of emotion. It can be any number of emotion, okay? It can be fear, it can be laughter, it can be anything. That's what's important about emotion. You're good, by the way. He barely flinched. All right. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Juicy quote from Maya. So here's the pyramid. We start at the bottom. So the product attributes are the things that you do to deliver benefit. And then if you work up a step, it's how you improve customer's life. Those are the same benefits from the, the first positioning model. And then you get into the, the next layer of this pyramid, which is emotional benefit. How do you aspire to make people feel? And the last is the aspiration. We're all building products to dent the universe. So what is the something bigger about your brand? So I'm going to illustrate it. 2016 World Developer, Developer Conference for Apple. These are people waiting three hours before the door opens. Okay. Do you think they're into Apple? Who remembers this? What was going on here? Hope, what was happening? This, this, the, 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 the anvil was thrown against the man, okay, breaking the status quo. Remember this first little user-centric, friendly little desktop machine? And think about the positioning here, okay? Who do you want to be here? Who are you? Can you imagine this? Just think about what the, the feeling this is. Like, occasionally, I will dance to the music in my head down Burlingame in front of the Apple store, okay? You know, think about what this is talking about, what it's wanting you to feel. And then who's this dude? Picasso, why did they choose Picasso? Or in the Think Different ad, why did they choose all of these people? Who are they? Who are these? What, what, what do they have in common? Leaders. They're leaders? What kind of leaders? Visionary. Visionary. What are they doing? They are changing the world, right? You're starting to get a hint about what the something bigger is at Apple. And, you know, this is a badge of who you are. Barrett's got an iPhone 10. okay? I'm like on 7, okay? All right, and then has anybody been to the Apple Store in New York City? Wow, just an amazing picture of who Apple is. All right, so let's look at the brand pyramid for them. The bits and bytes about what Apple provides. In the old days, it was personal computers, it was printers today. It's all about mobile digital products and services. And the benefit, they work to make you feel, uh, to deliver creative skills, make it you more productive, and the easy human-centered design. But how do they want you to make you feel? Remember that ad with the, the dancing dude? They want you to feel free, and they want to essentially unleash your imagination. Now, would you pay $200 more for a product that does all these things? Yes, okay? My MacBook Pro cost 1400 and I could have gotten the Dell for 700 but I'm one of the cool kids, damn it, okay? <laughs> and the something bigger at Apple is revolutionary innovation. Can you see the power of a brand at work and why you would pay extra money for this? It's amazing. And yes, they had a wonderful ad campaign called Think Different that embodied all these ideas. So now I'm going to show you Netflix. So the product attributes, the bits and bytes of what they deliver. Today, it's TV and movie streaming. 
and increasingly its original content. In the old days, it was DVD by mail. Those attributes changed over time, but the benefits were very consistent. Fast, easy, entertaining, and this great value. We wanted you to feel delight. We were positioning ourselves against that bastard blockbuster where I would go in, I would spend 15 minutes wandering the rows, and then I would wait 10 minutes in line to pay the snot-nosed kid. I would take the DVD or the, the, the whatever those things, cassette home, and then my family would say, Gib, Dad, we've already seen this. <laughs> and it got worse because I failed to return it and I had to pay the late fees. Okay? So you can see why we were trying to create a delightful experience. The something bigger for us, we were trying to provide this escape from reality. Think for a moment about the first time that you went to a, a as a kid, a movie theater on one of those, like when you saw E.T., this escape from reality. This was the idea we were trying to deliver. Now the idea that, that en enveloped all of this, it's not an ad execution. But Neve Savage was my marketing partner at Netflix. I, I joked that he tattooed the phrase, movie enjoyment made easy across my forehead. Okay? Gib, if you can deliver an experience where movie enjoyment is made easy, then we're going to win. Because that's what the brand and product want to be about. You canceled? It was too much. Money? No, it was like, it's like an escape from reality. Like, you come to watch this TV, TV show. Yeah. Tomorrow yeah. You, 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 you found yourself binge watching too much? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. That, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> but just one question. Yeah. What, what is the key thing about, I mean, now we're talking about Netflix. Yeah. This is the same with Yeah, okay. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, I'll repeat the question. Uh, what's unique about this such that HBO or Amazon aren't, can't do the same, okay? So let's come back to the product strategy. So brand is one of those hard to copy components. At Netflix, the, the other thing we did from a product point of view, we built a network effect. So every device that you buy today that, that's connected to a television or is a television, will let you stream movies instantly. That was a hard to copy network effect. The unique technology is all about the scaling and the personalization, the fact that, that Netflix knows the movie taste of 120 million and it informs what original content series they should build or not. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, well, let, let's, after the fact, the company we were competing with was Blockbuster. And today, the Burlingame Blockbuster is a pet store, which I feel very good about. Okay? Today, uh, how, how do I think about the HBO brand versus Netflix? I mean, it's, it's an interesting one. Today, the real competition is the creative community that's building the movies and TV shows. Do they go with Netflix or do they go with HBO? And increasingly, they're saying yes to Netflix, really because they have so much freedom and latitude. How long should our episodic TV series be? Whatever length you want. Do I have to break every eight minutes for ads? Shit, no. Okay. So they're, they're actually competing uh, on the basis of the brand. Re really neat question. Okay. So now we got to work. We're, we're going to work for SC. So this is products that count. I know Sean. You should all go to his talk on 4.4 in San Jose. Uh, so what are the things, the bits and bytes about what, what Products That Count provides? What, is it, what does it do? You're at one of its things. What's this? It does monthly talks. Okay. What else does it do? It's the bits and bytes about what the Product That Count product is. The attributes. We've talked about the benefits already. How does SC want you to feel right now and when you walk home? Guesses? Inspired. 
inspired. That would be awesome. Okay, how else does she want you to feel? Cool. cool. Okay, and what's the something bigger? What does products that count want to do to dent the universe? <laughs> bigger, bigger. This is the hardest part of this model. Okay, what's big? What's what's something big that products that count can enable? Uh, build a big community, and what's that community going to do? Yes, it, that that community could change the world. Now you're thinking bigger. Okay, you want to say something? No, same thing. You know, leveraging everyone's working on different products. Do you improve everyone here a little bit? I would pay $24 for tonight, okay? <laughs> All right, so let's look at, at, at what we got. I was kind of, I was thinking about what were world-changing products and invention. I'm like, yeah, the light bulb. That really changed the world, okay? Uh, so the product attributes, the, it's all about these online and offline programs in major tech hubs. So how many cities are you in now? And how many are you going to be in five years from now? Thousands, okay? <laughs> the benefits, helps you to connect, to learn and grow. And SC, she would love you to feel inspired and emboldened so that you can go out and build world-changing products. Wow, wow, I would pay for that. And then the way that we put a wrapper around this model was simple, not a marketing execution, not a headline, just a way that, that folks that are engaged in helping to build products that count. It's all about the fact that everyone can build great products. So this is that second model. So the power of a brand. How many of you have the iPhone 10? Okay, the cool kids, okay? So think about what's going on. When you choose Apple, you engage in revolutionary innovation, and a brand is a reflection of how you see yourself. And defining the brand provides the team with the tools needed to create a consistent experience as the company grows. The brand, the marketing team, defines what that brand wants to be, and the product team works to figure out how to bring that idea to life. Together, brand and product can delight customers in these hard to copy, margin enhancing ways. That's how it works. This is how you keep people from fighting with each other. Okay? All right, so I want to share with you the evolution of Netflix from 1998 to, to today. And just two stories. One is about consumer science. This is better living through data and A-B testing. And then a uh, healthy obsession over trying to get inside all of your heads to keep innovating on a better experience that will create that delight for you. So this is what Netflix looks like today. Happy family on the couch. I just want to bring you back to 1998. Okay, designers in the room. Okay, You could spend $4 and a DVD would magically arrive in the mail about eight days later. Okay, uh, and then by 2004, think about a little bit of emotion there. This is competing against Blockbuster. In fact, the key insight, the three words that really pay in 2006 is no late fees. That's how you beat Blockbuster. It took us a while to figure that out. We launched streaming in 2007. Anybody recognize this movie? Is it Red or is it Dragon Class? I'm not sure. Um, the point is we launched with 300 sucky movies. And then we had to figure out how do we talk about a service that really has got two things, this DVD by mail and this unlimited streaming thing. It got complicated quickly. And we started to work it out. And you can see down on the bottom the how it works is all about the DVD series. And look to the right. As a bonus to your DVDs, you can watch some movies over the internet on your TV as often as you want, anytime you want. Okay? And then by 2010, it's a flip. Down below, it's now leading with streaming, plus you can get DVDs by mail. And then 2011, finally, it's about streaming. 
Still a pretty complicated site, right? And we learn in every freaking A-B test that simple beats complex, except on the damn non-member page. Every time we tested something simpler against this, simpler would lose. And the main reason was more stuff on a page communicates more value, okay? But finally, by 2012, the simpler experience started to win. Why was that? Oh, thank you, I love you. The brand, so much meaning invested in the brand, that the brand carried all that value. And it got even simpler. And simpler, until this is what you see today. Would you give your credit card to this company? <laughs> right? Think about how simple it got. Think about how much power there is in that brand. And the product matches it. So today, increasingly, Netflix is trying to out HBO, HBO, before HBO tries to out Netflix, Netflix. And I think Netflix is winning. But it's about the original content. It's a simple experience. It's highly personalized. It's cool. Was not always easy. So I, I, I'm sorry for the three people from Uber that didn't identify themselves for picking on you. I now will reveal all the mistakes that Netflix made and recovered from. This was, does anybody remember Quickster? This was Quickster. The market cap went from 40 billion to 10 billion in a quarter. If you were the CEO, Tim, how would you feel about that? <laughs> okay, bad, yes. So there was the Quickster debacle, kerfuffle. Uh, the company went public. At the same time, there was an anthrax scare and people were afraid to open their envelopes for fear of white dust killing them. That was hard. Uh, I once made a little mistake. Uh, early on, early on I, I don't know if you remember DVD by mail, you had something called a Q, but it was pronounced Quay by all Americans. We shipped all, all of the titles in, in 100,000 customers' queues at the same time by mistake. We were filling up people's mailboxes. Okay? Nice note, Wait, just, just send them back when you've watched them all. Throttling, class action lawsuit that hung over, people, we were accused of slowing down dis delivery, which I maintain is not true, but it was a huge brand hit. Uh, and I came back from a backpacking trip in Yosemite. I was away for three days, and someone said, I, I came out and they said, good time not to be at Netflix. I said, what do you mean? He said, your site's been down for three, year, uh, for three days, okay? These are the things that happen. The, the message in all this is that we just kept getting better. This is Reed Hastings, he's an engineer, but he had this notion about the importance and value of a brand. And we were just like stoked when we saw stuff like this happen. Imagine if a startup and you see your brand emblazoned on a, on a freaking airplane. Uh, Reed and I are about the same age and we were both kind of confused by this. <laughs> but Google let me know what it was about. <laughs> uh, so for you this evening, what I, what I encourage you to do, and I know Essie will be doing this over the next few years, Think about the positioning of your brand and your product. So work through the exercises to deliver, to, to define sort of the true north for your product team. And if you're in product, make sure you understand what the positioning and the brand that your marketing partners hope that you will deliver. In that Netflix evolution, every freaking two weeks, we were sitting in focus groups and then committing these new ideas to A-B tests and we tested uh, those, those non-member homepage that I shared with you every two weeks for life. Uh, and that's how we got insight about how to be best package and position in ways that resonated with all of you over the years. And that, that's my notion of you know, A-B test the homepage forever. Because that's where you really learn about what will motivate customer behavior. And then you got my message about how brand and product can work effectively without killing each other. So with that, I have a juicy quote. Today, brands are not the preserve of a marketing department. Brands are too important to be left to marketing or any other department. Organizational ghettos do not create vibrant, 
world-changing brand. I have a little secret. Uh, so, so with that, I'll say thank you and invite questions from you. I think I have time for those. Great. So you guys have some questions. Andy. Sorry, this came like slides ago. But um, did you, when did you guys notice at Netflix, um, or Netflix and show, and did your team ramping to uh, double down on it? What were some of the stories that kind of? Yeah. So the question was about Netflix and chill. Uh, when it started to pop up, what did you think about it? And did you do anything about it? Uh, my introduction, there was a dude at my door at Halloween. He had a red Netflix shirt and a bag of ice. And I asked him what he was. So that's when I began to learn about it. Um, I guess, uh, so no, we didn't do anything to double down or take advantage of it. Um, Yeah, and I, I think we were um, surprised and delighted and anxious all at the same time. That, but it was really neat. Like, in the old days, I was like totally stoked if somebody saw me in airport security and said, you work at Netflix because I had a red backpack. So, you know, it was, so I, I guess uh, I was generally positive compared to back then. You had a question. Um, yeah. Yes. Streaming services, or was it irrelevant? Yeah, okay. So the question was about uh, Quickster. Um, so just to remind you, what was going on with Quickster was we had about 90% of our customers were streaming, binge watching, and about 10% were getting DVDs by mail. We were all students of the innovator's dilemma, uh, and so and we had killed Blockbuster. Blockbuster spent too much time and attention on retail and not enough on the future. So we didn't want to be guilty of spending too much time on DVD and not enough on our streaming future. So the solution was to throw all of the DVD people out of the building and that formed Quickster. Andy Rendish was the CEO of that company for one week. He didn't like it. He was on Saturday Night Live you know, as a caricature. Uh, so, short answer, it was very bad for the Netflix brand. Um, so, uh, you know, like John Oliver, everybody thought, you know, what were you smoking? Um, it was executed poorly. There was a leak. Um, someone, it, they had created a DVD envelope for Quickster, and somebody from one of the operations hub had brought that envelope home to show a neighbor, and they were from the press. So they had to do a rush job on the execution that went poorly. Um, and then I just, I told you, the market cap went from $40 billion to $10 billion, so it's really bad. The real question, what was, what was Reed's response? Because he, he said, listen, I lost my humility, made a mistake, um, and he just, what he said to the company is, just keep getting better. Like, fundamentally, culture of the company is sound. We understand how to delight customers. We made a big mistake, but as long as we keep innovating like we have, we'll recover. Today, the company's worth 120 billion, so recovery is pretty complete. Yeah, um, you. Yeah. Yep. So, thinking of Facebook and what's happening with the internet, how do you, when you have a PR crisis, how many do you Yeah, the question is, uh, and by the way, this is not, it's not my area of expertise. Um, I can handle product crises. Uh, but the question is, Facebook has got a bit of a challenge today uh, with issues around privacy, and what do you do with these? Anybody, any marketing professional want to answer the question for me? Is that possible? Where are you, lifties? Here? Here? I, I, I heard you, but can't see you. Do you have a good answer for how to handle a crisis like that? This is a lifty marketing leader speaking now. Yes? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the bottom line is that you have to be aligning your public messaging with what you're doing. I think we have hit a point where consumers expect that you are being truthful and honest with them. And if you go out and make public messaging that is at odds with what you're actually doing, it's, it's way 
Got it. So here's the answer, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, figure out what the right response is to this crisis. Over communicate it to all the employees and then send the same message to the world at large. And I think you're advocating transparency as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so make sure that the internal communication, the external is all aligned. Yes, um, Verna. How, how do you link um, your branding to your product strategy? What's the thing that you're doing with your brand? Because obviously you guys came up with Jesus along the way at some point you decided to change the number. Um, but at the beginning you had like a topic that you Yeah, so the, the question was, uh, I can tell you're a careful reader. Uh, how do you bring the evolution of the brand into your quarterly product strategy meetings? So I had a product manager who was focused on the non-member site. You saw the evolution of the non-member site. So every quarter, he and she were bringing results and learnings from the qualitative and from A-B tests. Uh, and then they were giving some insights from their area to the rest of the team that was building the product. The, the, main, you know, I, the rest of the team had gotten the memo uh, about the product that simple trumps complete. Whenever we created a simple experience for you on the website that you were using, it beat more complicated things. Um, so I, I told you the, the last place that that worked was on the non-member page. And that, it was fascinating. I mean, they had gotten the memo from the rest of the product team, like, freaking make a simpler non-member page. And they were baffled that it didn't work. But I think, you know, our explanation was more stuff on page communicates more value. Uh, yes. Um, pretty clear Apple's entering the market. What do you Yeah, so the question is, um, he's pretty sure that Apple is going to, do you think they're going to do original content? Well, they're, they're, they're spending like billions of dollars. Yeah, okay. So uh, he believes that, that uh, our dear friends at Apple will uh, launch their own original content. The question is, uh, what do you think Netflix is doing about that or should do that? Uh, so Netflix has been engaged in original content since House of Cards launched. How many of you watched House of Cards? Okay. Uh, that was actually 2013. Um, and this year they're going to spend $8 billion on original content, which is a lot of money. Um, so they've been accelerating the development of original content for these last five years. Um, because they have 120 million world member worldwide that consistently to pay 12 bucks a month, they can afford to write those big checks. Um, so they have an economy of scale. I suspect they're ahead of Apple on that dimension. Um, so for, they've just been off to the races. The beauty of original content, especially episodic TV content, is that um, they own it and they can deliver it on 40 languages worldwide. So there's no right, rights issues. So they figured out how to monetize it worldwide. And the beauty of uh, episodic TV original content is you create a relationship with a character in the first couple of hours, and then you can go for 100 hours. You can go to season 10 of Breaking Bad. You can't do that with movies. Nobody wanted to see Rocky VI, which was the only the 10th hour. And this is the real beauty of uh, episodic original content. And obviously, uh, I'm sorry about your negative binge-watching experience, but most folks like that. Uh, okay, Barrett, what you got? Yeah, I'm curious. Is there a general school of thought about what percentage of a company's overall market cap or value is associated with brand equity? So of $120 billion value, that's like, like, oh, 15% goes towards brand equity. I'm curious if there's a school of thought. Um, 
There might be rules of thumb, which I've learned not to totally trust. I mean, this is, I've learned to avoid politics, politics but like the stage, but for instance, you know, I think Trump puts half of his net worth against Fran, half, okay? Um, so uh, it's a better question for finance and accounting uh, and maybe what you can get away with, um, but incredibly valuable, right? So think of what um, Apple, you've all given Apple permission to do amazing things. You've given Starbucks permission to do amazing things. You've given Nike permission to do amazing things. Um, so I, I, I know it's a lot more than zero dollars. <sighs> this is so hard. I, I just, you're, you have such a tall, uh, a long arm, I love it. So the question was, can you talk about internal branding which must look different from what you see outside? So I did share with you the, the work that Neve shared with me, my marketing partner, to give direction about how to build a better product. Um, it was simple uh, and clear, and I deeply appreciated that. Uh, at Netflix, there was not a lot of adornment for internal communications. I mean, they would throw up if they saw my slides today because I was trained to use the basic PowerPoint with only one font. Um, so there was no adornment within. Have I answered your question? Yes, yeah, got it. Yeah, great idea. Okay, the question is, how did Neve really get to the simple description of both the positioning and the brand? It only took him two years, okay, it was hard. Uh, he did work with an outside ad agency. There was a lot of exploration in qualitative with normal people who lived outside the Bay Area who were not Silicon Valley freaks, which is all of us. Um, so, you know, my recollection was a lot of work, um, but I appreciated the end result. Yes. Ah, yeah, great question. Um, so when folks in product were building new interface for the movie display page or whatever, how did the consulting work with, with the marketing of brand partners to make sure it was on brand? Is that the question, uh, among other things? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna give you a surprising answer. So the, the, the thing in Netflix, it's all about being tightly aligned and loosely coupled. So the product team was building a great product and the marketing team was building a great brand and we worked to, to absolutely minimize the amount of interaction. So I could make product decisions like what should a movie display page look like or the home page look like without talking to my marketing partners in the way that they didn't need to talk to me to talk about how Roku used the Netflix brand. Um, yes, there were some mistakes and we fixed them later, but the cost of coordination is super high because it slows down all the decision making. And so I could do that same model. I, I didn't, nobody in content would ask if we should make an investment in original content of me. And, and I didn't have to tell them how I was planning to merchandise it either. So the concept was tightly aligned. We all understood the overall strategy and the metric and only loosely coupled. So to keep us nimble and fast in our decision making. Yes. I'm curious to know like what qualitative or test results are you getting the less you're complicated than watching? <laughs> you're such a genius. Yeah. Okay. Uh question was what was the thinking, testing, et cetera, around binge watching? I gotta confess there wasn't a lot of thinking and there wasn't any testing. <laughs> um so remember we had three hundred titles available, we had some episodic TV. Um, we, we were at an amazing disadvantage. <laughs> uh, so, so, and, and we, we hated windows. 
Um, windowing is uh, a movie comes out on a theater and we can only get the rights to it three months later. Um, we just hated that concept because it doesn't, didn't seem to be pro you, pro customer. So we said, okay, we're just going to put it all on the site and people can watch it at whatever pace they want. Um, I, I swear to God, that's what I remember. Okay, um, maybe there's been debates since uh, about other ways, but it seems so right thing to do, customer friendly, create more value for them. And I, again, I'm really sorry about your experience binge watching. <laughs> okay. Okay, good, good. No, no, I mean, honestly, uh, like, uh, there's, a, there's a little seasonal effect. People, as summer approaches, the weather gets better and they, they cancel and then they just turn it back on when, in September, like, whatever you want. Okay, this is the last question. Um, okay, I, the question was, do you test with consumers before you actually launch? Yeah, but how much? How much? How much a lot. Up? Yeah, okay. Okay, so the question is, uh, how much, so I, I recognize, I, I, I am no longer at Netflix. Um, my guess today, Netflix is running a thousand tests in parallel right now. So it is a consumer science machine. Uh, there's a lot of machine learning largely um, figuring out what you would like to watch and not watch. Um, yeah. And, yep, that was early days. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it has changed. Yeah, the big, I mean, the puzzle that they're deeply engaged in today is new content types. Um, would they ever do sports? Would they ever do news-like things? I don't know. Um, but the real question is trying to figure out each of your member tastes uh, through the personalized algorithms. All right, so I said I had a secret. Um, today's my birthday, so the gift I would like from you is feedback. So SC has already sent a link to a Net Promoter survey for me, as well as a PDF of the presentation. But if you don't have time to wait for that email, you can go to my little baby website, and the first thing you'll find is click here to, to give Gib feedback because it's his frickin' birthday, okay? So thank you very much. It's been joy to be with you. I'm gonna hang out forever, have a beer. I can answer a zillion questions for you as well. Thank you. Gib, thank you, and happy birthday. Thanks, thank you very much. All right, well, um, so, one thing we're going to do now is uh, shout out. So shout out, this is how it works. You come over here, and if you want to tell people you are hiring, you're looking for a job, you're launching a startup, you're looking for co-founders, you're looking for founding, whatever it is, come here, and you're going to get 10 seconds each to make your announcement. It's one of the best ways to get what you need. So please line up right here. Um, while you do that, and please bear with me for another minute. While you do that, please gather here. Um, I want to tell you about the talk next month. We're going to be switching gears completely. And instead of talking about brands and, and aspirations, we're going to talk about security and how you take a, a deep tech security product and build it up. And I've invited the head of growth, former head of growth at RSA to, to share those insights with us. It's next month. All right, come on over. Thanks, SC. Um, I'm Eric Dew. I'm CEO of Bullseye Inc. And we are offering you mobile flow. I love my phone. I love mobile products. I love the aluminum, the glass, everything associated with it. But we make this product that sticks to the back of any device. We're the only ones that offer you mobile flow. This isn't just a direct competitor for everyone else you've seen, like pop sockets that stick to the back of your phone. It's all aluminum. You spent a lot of money on this great product that gives you the most attachment to all the information ever in the history of humankind. Why not get a, a quality experience? It's not just this product. It's the six colors we're going to be offering to complement your phone. It's not just that. It's the flow experience you get of taking this and sticking it right, easily and comfortably on any device, whether it's your car, whether it's your bike, whether it's your home, whether it's your desk, whether it's a tablet, from one device to another, everyone in your family can use the same stands, the same mounts, the same accessories. There's absolutely nobody in the marketplace addressing mobile flow. 
So come check it out. As also as a gift to SC and, and products that count, I love this. Uh, anyone who goes to our site, bullseye, B-U-L-L-Z-I.com, if you use the checkout code PTC, you get 20% off and it's free shipping. So thanks very much. Come check it out. Thanks. Thank Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Clement. I'm a product manager at Blend. And so you know, please bear with me. This is my first time doing a recruiting pitch. Uh, so what is Blend? Blend is basically like TurboTax for mortgages. It's a way for borrowers to very easily wrap up a mortgage application with banks such as US Bank and Wells Fargo. So we're always looking for product managers, designers, engineers, BD growth. Um, you know, we're really excited to be changing the way that the mortgage industry happens today. We really want to make it so that's accessible for all consumers to be able to easily get mortgages and to have a much easier time kind of, you know, getting to a home because we see home ownership as the key driver in the US economy for wealth and socioeconomic status. Um, so again, Clement Cal, feel free to uh, chat with me afterwards or find me on LinkedIn. We're always hiring. Um, so yeah, blend. Thanks, guys. Anybody else wants to do a shout out? My name, my name is Tony. Uh, I'm a kids coding teacher. I run an online school called Block School. We teach kids in about 15 countries via video chat in a fun Minecraft-like world. I need computer science teachers, so if you enjoy working with kids and you know how to code uh, even moderately well, give me a call or uh, get, shoot me an email at tony at block.school. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Julian. I just moved here about a week ago from Portland. Um, I am looking for a UX design job currently. So if any of you guys have any leads, I'd really appreciate it. Um, I recently just worked uh, redesigning a startup application. So if you guys have anything, just let me know. OK, thank you very much, guys. Hey, just real quick. Uh, the name's Ben Meadowcroft. I'm in product management for an enterprise tech company based down uh, in Palo Alto. So if any of you want to come down Welcome Enterprise Tech, Palo Alto. Yeah, it was a really great company to work for. Uh, pretty aggressive, fast-growing startup. Little under $300 million in funding currently. Looking to IPO in the near future. So always hiring for product management. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everybody. There's another half hour of networking. We're going to be closing the door at, doors at 9. Thank you very much. I hope to see you next month.